welcome to a new Harry's Garage video and today's car is one of my all-time favorites it's the Porsche Carrera GT this one dates from 2004 so one of the first cars to come off the line but it's a car well I fell in love with it in year 2000 way earlier September at the Paris Motor Show and that was because we all gone across to Paris Motor Show and waiting to open at eight o'clock in the morning. But a few days before um, we tripped over to Paris, we had this little note from Porsche saying, we've got something to show you, but we're going to um, show it before the show opens. Can you come along to the Louvre uh, Museum at six o'clock in the morning? And then we'll show you this. It's something a bit special. It'd be worth the effort. And that is when Porsche showed us this car. We all assembled, lights went down, a film started, and there was water roll behind the wheel of the concept of the Carrera GT, hammering through the Nevada desert. It was very memorable. We just had no idea this, was gonna, this car was coming from Porsche. And then it flicked to a live screen, and it was all black outside. It was actually raining that morning. It was still dark. And down the Champs-Élysées, you could see these headlights coming towards you. And then you realise it was water roll driving the concept car into Paris, down the Champs-Élysées, and outside the Louvre Museum. Well, you just could have um, dropped a pin. Um, and when he pulled up outside, lights went on in the arena, and we all piled outside and saw the concept. Anyway, so from that moment on, it's been a real favourite. This is my memento from that event. Um, they gave us this Carrera GT Paris Motor Show 2000, the Louvre Museum, and it was the engine, because the engine is almost the star turn in this car. Let's go and have a closer look. Now, when that screen lit up for that morning in Paris, the first thing you say, God, it's like the, it's a boxer. What is this car? We hadn't been told anything. But then you heard the, the engine note as water accelerated away, and it was this screaming engine. Remember, we didn't have any details when the film started. And it was obvious this had a very special engine in it, and it was fast. This sort of boxer look, but it was obviously a bigger car. And it was, it was just one of those magic moments as a journalist when you get to see something completely new before anyone other journo, you know, you're just in a room of about, there was 50 or 60 of us there, I suppose. Um, a really magic moment. The actual production car is very faithful to that concept car we saw that morning. I was looking at the Evo, I did take some photographs of it, but it's the early days of digital and they're only, I can't find them, but they're on, in the magazine. I looked at the dash, had an LCD dash in it rather than the dials you get now. Um, it had trick seats. They were these sort of um, support seats that flicked up and that supports your thighs when you were really pressing on. And they had sort of flick up cameras as well so you could record your heroic moments on track. None of that actually made production. But what did was the 20 inch uh, magnesium knock on wheels at the rear, 19 inch at the front. They have these spinners. You can see the colors on the spinners as well. That signifies whether they're left or right hand frets. If we go around to the other side, you'll see that they're red because if there's anything like most cars, I haven't actually taken these off, but there'll be left-hand thread on the left-hand side and right-hand thread on the right. And also carbon brakes. We hadn't really seen carbon brakes on a production car. This is sort of early days of that. And these are the biggest brakes on a production car yet seen at the moment this came out. It was also quite big when we saw it. I mean, it's got a V10 in the boot, so it's not really surprising. Again, the Enzo hadn't appeared at this point, um, so we just didn't know what to expect, what this car was up against, but uh, we were just mighty excited about the whole concept. Were Porsche really gonna do this? And they were hoping to build, they, they said they were judging what interest they got in the car, and if they got 500 orders, they'd put it into production. And guess what they did. Right, let's have a look underneath the front. And open the back up as well because I love looking at the practicality of the car, and there is a modicum of practicality with a Carrera GT. There we go. Reasonable size, I love how this is sort of quilted. Really nicely done. And this has a sort of special feature. Well, one thing I'll show you is this. This is, this is the special socket that you take the wheels off. So Carrera GT. There we are and what, what torque etc to have on it and it's made of aluminium so a really nice touch. Porsche love sort of doing the spec. If I lift that up 
that tells me the spec of this car, what options it had on it, those two options. I don't know the codes, I haven't checked them, but if you, if you ever look at them, that's where you find that normal sticker. On a normal Porsche, it sort of hides up here, doesn't it? You might have noticed I've left the roof on and the roof panels fit in here as well. Okay, first thing you have to do is release at the back, that one, and then this one. There we go. And then you have to remember which goes in the boot first. So I lift this panel up, up it comes, and it comes out like that. It's made of carbon fibre, so it's, it's crazy light. And you then basically have to flip it, turn it around like that. And you can sort of see the cutouts there, where it fits. Beautifully done. Remember to put those, those that's what I released to release it. You have to press that down and then you get the other side. And this one, you don't flip, you keep it the same way around and it goes slightly skew with. If I just put that in there, there, there we go. You can just see the cutouts there. That's what I'm looking at to, that's your guide to where they go. Then, if I was doing this properly, you'll see these straps and then you just use these and you strap it across and that ties down your roof. So neat, so Porsche. And then you have the open cabin and the star turn, of course, which is this manual gearbox, um, a six speed gearbox in this car. And when I was that September 2000 day, that was a bit of a bone of contention. I had a word with Harg Lage, who was head of design at Porsche at the time. He was adamant that it was, this car was going to have a sequential paddle shift gearbox. And Walter Roll says, no, it's going to have a manual gearbox because I want this to be a real driver's car. And I don't get the driving pleasure from the sequential change gearbox. Well, guess who won? Water Roll won, and that's why we've got a six-speed manual gearbox. And now the engine lives under this carbon fibre flap, and here it is. Now, first thing that greets you when you lift that up, actually, are these suspension uh, units. It has this sort of push rod suspension, so rather than the, wish, sort of the spring and the damper living sort of in the wheel arch itself, via a set of levers, this is very motorsport-like, um, this actually makes, brings the force up from the wishbone as it moves and presses the spring in this way. Makes it really easy to adjust um, it's, it's, and it takes unsprung weight away. So um, it, it, it puts it here rather than it having to go up and down with the wheel. That's the theory. These grills cover, these are the air intake. So it's actually um, sucking air from the side um, you'll see as the door scallop on the side of the car, the air comes in here, into these chambers. Now one of the criticisms of this car you hear, generally on forums and a few of the early cars, was the clutch, because it's got a tiny diameter clutch. No one discusses the positives of having a tiny diameter clutch. It's a multi-plate carbon uh, clutch, it's a race car clutch. That means it's very small diameter, which means the engine can be put even lower in the chassis. It's dry sumped as well, the oil filler here. Um, but the small clutch gives you so many advantages because it just revs, blips, and we take it outside. It's instantaneous uh, rev gain because it's only trying to spin this little clutch, this little flywheel. And you think if you have a great big flywheel as you find on a car or a diesel car, you've got quite a lot of momentum to make that spin. On a, on a Carrera GT, the V10, tiny clutch pack, just revs in an instant, like a motorbike. You don't need a flywheel on a motorbike. It's the same with this. And then at the back is this manual gearbox. Very small little unit, compact down there. And it means all the weight is this side. You think there's the, there's the, the wheels. There's no sort of overhanging transaxle or anything on this car. It's all tucked away there. And when I saw the, the concept car in Paris, when they revealed it that day in September 2000, it was 5.5 litre V10. Um, footwork, as we uh, it didn't realise at the time, being an F1 engine, it was meant to be 3 litre, so they really stretched it to 5.5. And then the boards, they had this nickel side coating on it, so all aluminium unit, 
But I remember Horatio Pagani seeing this for the first time was amazed by something I hadn't spotted when we first saw it, and that was the carbon fiber construction. If you look at the Pagani Zonda, um, it hangs all the suspension off a steel frame that comes over the engine, then mount into the carbon tub. I haven't mentioned the carbon tub before, but this ba car is basically carbon. But this was another first to actually have structural carbon fiber for all the suspension units as well. Uh, that was new as well. So, so much to discuss on this car. This is an active spoiler as well. This comes up at 78 miles an hour. But it's just the workmanship on this car. I can't get over. A lot of little details. I love this little thing in here. If you're wondering where the toolkit is on a Carrera GT, well, there it is. It hides in there. Um, I think you've got a first aid kit, which is mandatory. On the other side is a um, safety triangle as well. That clips back into space like that. Um, so there we go. Let's go see what this car is all about by taking it for a drive now. So nice to get in one of these again. Key, old fashioned key, no starter buttons. And the key is on the left. And that's a sort of hangover from Porsche racing days. Apparently it was one of those things, if you think of the Le Mans start, you ran over, you had the key in that hand and your other hand could go the gear lever. Left hand drive, of course. Um, it's only left hand drive in Carrera GT. And as soon as you start it up, I can sort of hear a strange sort of chatter. It's a, it's a race car feel. It's like busy. It's not a sort of mix of gearbox and things going on. A very mechanical sound uh, as soon as you start it. And you've got conventional instruments in the production GT, uh, Carrera GT, as I say. When I saw the concept, that was an LCD readout, but no, not so. Lovely details. Balsa wood. Uh, gear knob to, to replicate the look of the 917 and what a car to replicate Carrera GT 0149 so this is number 149 off the line of the Ford 1270 built and then a Porsche dedicated Becker radio in the middle love how they've done that they've they've shrunk it down so then you turn it on and off on a button here and then you have volume and tuning and stuff on these other two knobs so it's not a din size radio so beautifully done and then all sort of conventional um stalks here just sort of normal one thing you notice when i was getting in it's quite a th thick seal being a carbon car the carbon tub super strong and that strength comes from that sort of ribbon and a conventional door that because you're trying to keep the strength from the tub isn't hasn't got a lot of space to get in and out of but hey if water roll can climb in and out of it at whatever height is six foot something um, then I certainly can as well right I'm gonna get going out the village and then you'll join me on some better roads or might be in birth I don't know So, first impressions as you get underway. Well, it's it's a bit noisy in here. Um, that's because of the carbon tub. Basically, all carbon cars are noisier. It just sort of resonates around the carbon tub. It was the same with the Zonda. Same, just all cars do it. Um, quite stiffly um, sprung, um, as you'd imagine. Great visibility out just easy. Wow that is pretty noisy isn't it for road noise. I hope you can still hear me. I've left the roof on thinking it would help. Um, it's got Michelin Super Sport tyres on this car. Uh, new Pilot Super Sports. Really important on the Carrera GT. The first tyres that came out with it gave it pretty spooky handling. It let go in an instant and it was quite hard to read. And the next generation tyre for Michelin, the Super Sport, really calmed things down and changed. We learned this at Evo when we did a test in 2013. There had always been, you know, Carrera GT was this wonder car, but oh, I didn't quite trust it at eight tenths and beyond. I remember Water Roll once telling me we did the I did a Porsche 918 um, event with him out of the Norse Life. Um, we were just chatting and we talking about the Carrera GT. 
and you're saying they used to have these industry days sort of behind uh, closed doors and you each brought each of the manufacturers brought along one of their star cars and you all got to try each other's star cars and typically there was with water roll there was a stop a stopwatch involved and um, quite a lot of timing going on and um, in the Carrera GT, of all these development drivers, he said we had the biggest spread of times around the, the Norse life in the Carrera GT compared to any other car, because it was hard to read to begin with. But on the new generation Michelin tyres, I think, I think it's a completely different car. And, I, and I, I found that out from the guy. We did this amazing test. We, have, we were discussing the ultimate analogue supercar and somehow, in September 2013, got together um, the McLaren F1 from McLaren for two days. Carrera GT, uh, we had the Noble, we had the Ferrari F50, we had a Ferrari F40 there, we had the Mercilago uh, SV670, I think we had that there. I mean, just the most... Oh, a Zonda. So how could I forget the Zonda? A Zonda F as well. Two days in Wales trying to decide which was the best analogue um, hypercar. And it was that car that was on these super sport tyres. And the owner of that car, he really enjoyed his Carrera GT. He'd just come back from a, a track day at the Hungal Ring, I seem to remember. It had 45,000 miles on it and it was just mega on that test. We'll get to that in a moment. So yeah, they're sort of usable things, Carrera GT. It's why I'm always suspicious of them and you see them for sale. And like this car, I think if I just go through the memory, how many miles has it done? This car has done 2,400 miles, which is ridiculous. It's nice that it's got the stalks, this, you know, it's nothing particularly alien. It's got a normal Porsche wheel. That was about the only thing we could criticise on it was the wheel was quite big. You can see we're sort of running out of ideas of what to criticise on. Space is really good. And it gets me that the last car in uh, Harry's garage I reviewed was that Hurricane uh, Evo Spider. That's a convertible V10, 600 something horsepower car. And I weighed this car. This car weighed 1386 kilos, wet, as I'm driving it now. Um, that's light. Um, remember the Hurricane Eva, I think that was 1686 kilos. So 300 kilos heavier than this Carrera GT for the same engine. Okay, it's got four wheel drive and it's not made of carbon fiber, but it's made of aluminium. So this was a seriously light car. Um, engine 5.7 litre 604 horsepower so slightly bigger than the Huracan but not quite as much power but I suppose that's progress this is almost 20 years old this engine not that you'd know it but wow does it feel special and especially special when you've got a manual gearbox to control it all with and a lovely change with this six speed right I'm going to accelerate it out of Burford give you a little taste of the sounds surplus and yet it's civilized this roof on got great air conditioning or great heat as I want at the moment because it's seven about seven degrees outside even though it's a bit it's nice and sunny for once but uh, seven degrees as I say all those scare stories seem to just evaporate when you actually get behind the wheel of one <laughs> given the car for very long and they're having to turn around and go past the camera all the time and that used to show sort of paddle shift gearboxes at Ferrari up really badly and this clutch you know you just ease off it has an anti-stall mechanism in the ECU you just ease off in tick over and you're fine and then it just feels perfectly normal nice waiting just easy you forget about it not a little 
fun story I learnt on that test with the McLaren F1. That also has a tricky clutch, but no one gets to drive on, so no one talks about it. Oh, just listen to it. But the upside of that tricky clutch is just that, the way it revs. need a bit of heat in them to get working but once on track they're, they're ace as well as you can tell it's a bit of a fave of mine this car for not buying one when they were like £200,000. That was many uh, years ago, so forget that one. Some of the reason for that is, well, the servicing costs. Being a, a specialist sort of car, you have them in the UK, you have it serviced at um, Reading, uh, Porsche HQ in Reading, and every four years there's a service where the engine comes out because they do valve adjustment and things like that. So maintenance is quite expensive every four years, as is every single other car in this sort of genre. 10, 10 to 20,000 pound bill every uh, four years or so. 
but go run a Zonda, go run a McLaren F1 or a, a Ferrari F40 and F50. So yeah, it's not it's not a, a downside of this particular car, it's just the genre. Oh, I just love how that revs on that throttle. But it's, a, it's a bit bigger than I would like. The Zonda was smaller, but oh, listen to it. But I'm more comfortable behind the wheel in this car than I was in the Zonda. Let's move on to the positives. The engine, the robustness of this car. Funny enough, some of them like this one is two and a half thousand miles, and then others have 40, 50, 60 thousand miles on them. They seem to be pretty tough, these cars. And this, you think this is almost 15 years old, is it? It feels absolutely fine when you wood of this sort of mileage. But every one I've got in feels like this rattle free, beautiful workmanship engine work of art. You talk to um, Richard Tipper of Perfection, he adores these cars. It's one of his favourite, he's cleaned everything. And I can quite understand why. It's like a it's like a Patek watch if you like. It's just perfect everywhere you look, right the way through it. And then you have the performance. And I like it because it's not, it's mad, but it's not crazy Koenigsegg mad, shall we say, or Chiron or Veron mad. It's just about manageable. You will not learn this car the first time you get in it. But compared to the others, it's like a, a, an even better 4 GT to me. Um, Zonda was, uh, it's quite a tricky car at the limit, I found. I didn't really trust it. This one I want to learn. I know there's a water roll behind this car and he's really made it very special. And actually, on that test, when we actually had to decide which was the winner of our most analog car, it was really tight between the McLaren F1 and a Carrera GT. And you can't say more than that. The thing that got me was this was like a more accessible McLaren F1. I would still choose the F1 because it's even more special if that's possible um, and it has the most incredible induction bar you've ever heard known to man but the cost of the running uh, cost of them is off the scale this isn't a poor second this is a very close second if anything the manual gearbox is better in this than in the mclaren f1 the sound is the same the performance is it's smidgen behind but god you're not going to notice and it's accessible and it works and there's enough of them to go around 1260 and the, you put in the value against the McLaren F1 well suddenly 700,000 looks like a bargain so yeah the Carrera GT a slightly misunderstood hypercar in my book but one of the very best ever built in the history of the car oh. There you go, I'm off to have some fun. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video, it's giving you insight into the Carrera GT. If you have enjoyed it, well please subscribe and tick notifications to all that business. Keep watching because there'll be more videos coming along very soon.